Like a pack of immense sharks, warships of the rebellious free and independent midway star system roamed the dark emptiness of space, patrolling against any threats. At other stars, the crumbling but still powerful and predacious empire of the syndicate worlds gathered forces and tried to stamp out revolution wherever it flared into existence. Midway, strategically positioned and a leader among the rebel star systems, knew it was only a matter of time until the syndicate attacked again. I almost wish something would- Don't say it. I'm sorry, Commodore. It's just that there are few tasks more boring than standing sentry, Capitan Diaz said, especially deep in space, far from any planet or orbiting facility. And few things more dangerous than becoming bored or distracted as a sentry, Commodore Marfisa reminded him, her voice sharp, let alone jinxing us with careless wishes. I was about to say how important it was to stay alert, Diaz added quickly. He raised his voice for the benefit of the specialists on the bridge of the heavy cruiser Manticore. If you're on sentry and not paying attention, some enemy might sneak up and stick a knife in you. Or one of your superiors might catch you napping, Marfisa said. If that happens, you'll probably wish an enemy had killed you quickly instead. That's the syndicate way, Diaz agreed. But we rebelled against the syndicate. And that's why we're on sentry duty, Marfisa said. The syndicate wants this star system back under their control. Her gaze shifted to the display before her command seat. The huge hypernet gate that helped make Midway's star system very important hung in space only ten light minutes away, the massive structure seeming small and insignificant against a backdrop of endless stars. Space had a tendency to dwarf the mightiest human creations. The nearest ship traffic was almost a light hour distant, a boxy freighter plodding steadily along toward the inner star system. President Icenai, the only one whose orders Marfisa would respect, was four light hours away, on a planet orbiting only several light minutes from the star. Marfisa's warships were on their own out here, as was she. How long do you think it will be before they attack again? Diaz wondered. Marfisa shifted irritably in her own seat. How many times had they had this conversation? Maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe in the next minute. The only thing we know for certain is that the syndicate will be back, and they will be bringing a large enough flotilla to make us fight for our lives. The battle cruiser should be operational again soon. It needs to be operational now, along with our battleship, Marfisa grumbled, lowering her voice so only Diaz could hear. There were some things the specialists should not listen to. We'll be sitting ducks if the syndicate returns with a battleship of their own and all we still have in fighting condition are these cruisers and hunter-killers. An alert blared, causing everyone on the bridge to jerk to full alertness and frantically focus on their displays as a new symbol sprang to life near the hypernet gate. Ten minutes ago, something had arrived at the gate. The light from that event, 180 million kilometers away, only now reaching Marfisa's own flotilla. Boredom and irritation vanished in a flare of excitement and fear as Marfisa waited for Manticore's combat systems to identify the new arrival. We're getting a syndicate ID on it, the senior watch specialist reported, drawing a curse from Capitan Diaz. Marfisa had once envied those who commanded flotillas, imagining them free of the day-to-day -day responsibilities that kept lesser souls in constant labor and worry. But she had already learned that the burdens of being in charge— of having no one else to turn to for orders and guidance, were as heavy as a neutron star and as unforgiving as the pull of gravity from a black hole. And Marfisa would have to make all of the decisions. It would be almost four more hours before President Icenai even saw that a new syndicate ship had arrived in this star system.